All right, and then without any further ado, we will hear from the, uh, the illustrious Kirk Johnson. Do you need uh, the, the, the podium moved over a tad bit more? Do you want the podium moved a tad bit more over? Oh, yeah. move the tail. Podium. Well, it's on the edge of the camera. No, we can move the ta whole table over just a tad bit. Oh, if you could, that might, that might work better. Yeah, sure. I can stay out of there. Well, Hang on. The light's no, the whole thing would move. Yeah. The light would move with me. I will live through this. Okay. Okay. Let me try. Nope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are yeah, strong. Squeeze. Thanks for this opportunity. I am here to present, a physics, uh, present evidence of a physics path to peace and to explore this possibility that the reason we can't experience peace is not that it's impossible, but we've simply been going about it the wrong way. And what I'll talk about is observations and conclusions reached through several decades of pursuing peace. Including 20 years of scientific empirical research. My name is Kurt Johnson. This is what I do. I work this problem. I've been working it all my life. I'll tell you more about me in a little bit, but this is my occupation. This is I am I'm, I am trying to figure out how we solve this problem and our inability to cooperate on this planet. Playing synopsis. Okay. <clears throat> now the synopsis of this talk posted in the, in the websites, uh, on the college's website, gave several of my observations. Whoa, where did I go? There. There are three laws of physics that explain successful or peaceful societies. That's the first one. And we can build a successful society with knowledge of the principles. And the process we'll use is the same one we use to get the human plant. And finally, there's no inherent problem in human beings that prevents us from living in peace. Okay, there's a lot of things that people doubt about that and might even call impossible. You know, it's widely held conclusion that it's not possible for human beings to live in peace mainly because we are flawed, irrational creatures. That's what stops us. And it's, other people say it's simply a fact we were not meant to live in peace. And it's another well-known fact that it's impossible to use the scientific process to inquire into the nature of human beings or to establish a solution to our social dilemma. But I claim that's what I've done. That's what we'll talk about tonight. I gave two handouts. One of them is the PowerPoint that will go along with this conversation. And the other one was just an overview of what I do and a larger idea of my ideas. We won't discuss much of that, but it's a reference thing. But if you want to follow along, it'll be through the PowerPoint tonight. Now, what I have discovered, everyone is an expert on my subject. Everyone knows more about my field of study than me. 
Okay. So typically when I present my idea, I am ready with an absolute disbelief. And I'll be presented with a barrage of evidence that shows human beings don't fit the co-author rate. Okay? And what will happen is people will demand I meet their challenges and defeat their ideas before they're willing to give me any, give my ideas a hearing. And I'll admit, all so-called evidence, physical evidence, that backs up their claims. And it backs them up the same way until the very minute Orwell Wright flew on December 17, 1903 and became the first human being known to fly, all prior evidence would have backed up anyone's claim that human beings could not fly. Dialectics in action. Pardon? Dialectics in action. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, usually, because I can't disprove their points, the conversation ends with someone believing they proved me wrong before they even heard me out. So I am very happy to see you that you have this rule that only one fool gets to speak at a time, and I get to talk for a whole hour. <laughs> I'll make yeah. my case as well as I can. All right. And after which I'll be happy to answer any of your questions or discuss, discuss anything you've got to say. Well, I want to start telling you how I got to my ideas. I, I really have. I've always been obsessed with the idea of peace. I mean, I, will, I, I grew up in a world where it was dangerous, and it was a fearful place, and life was not fair. And that was rural Kansas. And it could have been anywhere else in the world. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the worst life. Many, many people have had far worse lives, had far worse conditions to contend with. But it still wasn't fair, it was dangerous. So, now, most people who grow up in those conditions, or many people, they, they accept this is just the way life is. But I never could do it. And, you know, some people get obsessions for rockets, and some for airplanes, and some for music, and some for TV. And I end up with this obsession to solve this problem and live in a peaceful world. It's just the way it is. And so, <clears throat> so what I did is I basically spent my life, you know, I, I protested, I got high, I got political, I read the philosophers, I did anything that anyone told me you could do to change this world. I ran off and joined the combo. I got religion. I tried it all. And I discovered none of it worked. Not a thing. I could not change the world. I didn't see anybody else change the world. Any change was, you know, it was fleeting, it was temporary, it was an illusion. The conditions we deal with just, just return. So, when I did it, I could see it would never work out. It wasn't me that got it wrong, it was just the condition to what, the, the, the recipe was never going to work. But I really couldn't explain why it didn't work. Now, about 20 years ago, I had run out of ideas completely. I had worn them all out. I couldn't find a new stage to read. I couldn't figure out a new idea. Nobody had one. I didn't know what to do. And at that time, I'd already given up on uh, changing the world as my vocation. I had actually gone back to the university. I had gone back to the university. That's my life history there. <clears throat> and. Uh, Got my degrees in accounting and went to work for an accounting firm, and it was the most interesting, exciting, challenging job I ever had. And I actually loved it. But it didn't last very long because I couldn't do it. And the reason I couldn't do it is because I had gone from trying to solve the problems of the world to actually building a world I didn't want to live in. And I, and I couldn't reconcile that myself. Okay, I could I couldn't do it. So I had to, I had no. I couldn't stay in that job, and I had no interest to go back to do anything I had been doing because it was I knew that the praying, change, protesting, revolution, all that crap wasn't going to work. And I was like, you know, I got social rigor and mortis. I didn't know where to go or what to do. I was just pro. And it was at that time that I actually got into the 
got just reading about flight. And not just the experience of flight itself, which is pretty phenomenal in my eyes, but it's just, does it strike you as interesting or fascinating that for 99.9% .9 of human history we could not fly? For thousands of years, people worked on that problem, and then one man figured out the solution to flight. Working by himself, wrote the laws of aerodynamics between the years of 1800, 1810, and the rest is history. We fly now. Took a hundred years from the time he wrote those laws to the time we figured out how to use them. But he did. Well, I did. I thought about that a lot. Because he solved a problem that nobody could solve before him. And I realized that what I was up to in trying to figure out how to change the world was solve a problem that nobody before me has been able to solve. So, I began studying flight to figure out if I could learn how to solve the problem of peace. <coughs> now, not, I didn't want, what I wanted to do was figure out how they solved the problem and see if I could get some information about that. But as I read up and I learned about peace, I began to see that peace and flight actually run parallel tracks through, through, through history. Ain't the most ancient civilizations we're aware of had to be a, left records indicating that they were dealing with the very same social problems we deal with today. Not one has been solved, not one has changed. And they also left records that they had aspirations to, to fly. They had drawings and sculptures of human beings with wings on their back. You read about mythology, and mythology explains both the history of peace and flight. And mythology tells us that human beings could once fly and once lived in peace. And mythology tells us that the reason we can no longer fly and the reason we can no longer live in peace is, well, we got disobedient, we got arrogant, we got rebellious, and we lost the power. And mythology also tells us how we're going to get back to flight. And that is we're going to become obedient again, or we're going to hunt and find in some secret cave in a chest, we'll find the magic potion or the magic words that will tell us what to do. We'll get back to peace and flight. It didn't work that way, did it? Now, think, consider this. Every, almost all children who wake up in this world wake up with an affinity for peace, an attraction to the idea of fair and happiness and safeness. And they also have this attraction to flight. They, every child dreams about being able to fly with a case on every Superman. So as these children grow into teens, many of them turn into socially active human beings. And many of them would, in an older day, would go pursue flight. But as they grow from their teens into their adulthood, the vast majority of people decide well, both of these experiences are impossible. And they put them aside and said, that's, you know, it's impractical. We don't need to do that. But in every generation, there has been a few people who were obsessed with flight, obsessed with peace, and they continued working on the pro problem, and they were considered hopeless romantics a lot. And many of them sacrifice their lives trying to prove one or the other. It's just, and I saw this, and I also saw the moment in 1903 when we learned how to fly, and I took in everything that's happened since. How flights literally transformed the world we live in. It's transformed our human experience. And the same barrier we broke this sound barrier dropped the bombs on Nagasaki, and we walked on the moon, and we actually got machinery on Mars. How much progress did we make towards peace? And the answer is absolutely none. We still haven't solved a single problem. And in fact, if you want to count advances towards peace, we haven't had a new idea on how to solve human social problems in over 2,000 years. We have every idea we know about today. Protest, hold a revolution, pray, whatever. 
older than 2,000 years. Nobody's actually come up with a new idea. They keep modifying the old ideas. They never work. <coughs> Again, all this observation led me to ask if there was any, if, if the process to flight could hold information about the process to peace. It was just a wild ass guess. So I admit, I had no clue. I was just asking, could it happen? So, and I needed something to do anyway. So with the reluctant agreement of my wife, I quit my job and I turned it back into my full-time work. And it took years to figure out how to even solve this problem. <coughs> but I ended up treating flight, the pro process of flight, as a process, as a systemic action. And I broke it down to its parts and I studied it. What I actually did was I subjected the process of flight to the scientific process, which I don't know if anyone else has ever done before. I broke it into observable steps. Now, I never learned how to build an airplane. I never learned the physics of airplanes, except in a general sense. I know nothing about building airplanes, and I could care less. What I wanted to know was how they figured the problem out. And I may, in this process, I may have conducted the most extensive study ever of the scientific process. And that's how I learned my science. And if you ask me, I think because doing it that way, I missed much of the misinformation that exists in the sciences, which I say there's much. And then I apply what I learned to the, to the questions of can we live in peace. And I found out you can't answer that question. Except you also ask and answer questions about human nature and human purpose. And you can ask and answer those questions through the scientific process. If you apply the scientific process as rigidly as it was applied to the pursuit of the airplane or any other funding process. By the way, I verified when I would, what I learned about flight and the finding process, I verified what I learned by researching, exploring the finding process related to the finding of the solution to smallpox and polio, by studying it relative to the finding of the gene, by studying it relative to the, to the finding of, uh, you know, the law of gravity. It's the same process for a group. It's a deep, it, is a, it has steps to it, it has parts to it that are essential if you're going to find something. It's pretty fascinating. So, that's how I got into it. Now, by one view of history, the airplane was invented by Orwin Wilbur Wright. After 40 years of experimentation, that's one view. By another view, the discovery of flight was a joint effort of a few hundred men beginning when George Cayley wrote the laws of aerodynamics between 1800 and 1810, culminating with the rights in 1903. By the third view, a possible view, the discovery of flight is a process of over 150,000 years, still underway, on a feet of the human race. I learned the way one views the world has everything to do with one, how one understands the world to be. The more accurate the view, the more accurate the understanding. The more accurate the understanding, the more one is able to do what is previously believed impossible, like transfer genes from fish to plants to change the characteristics of the plant. Or perhaps find a way to peace. But I find the accurate view is the bottom. 150,000 year process is still everybody. To understand the process of flight in that context is to change how one views the process and also how one views the home human race. Now, when I began, 
I thought the process to play would have very little in common with the process to peace. Because I was of a persuasion there were problems of two different dimensions. One was technological or physical, and the other was, well, spiritual or philosophical. One was about stuff outside of us, and the other was about stuff inside of us. One was about the non-living, and the other was about living. And I almost made the mistake of trying to explain the pursuit of flight in a philosophical adventure. But I got lucky, I think, and I saw something that caused me to treat a, a social problem as a technological problem, a social system as a mechanical system, not a part of human beings, but a tool used by human beings, no different than an airplane. They are physical structures, and they exist independent of us, and they conform to the laws of physics, and we build lousy social systems. Our social systems are no more successful than flying machines of the 17th century. They all fail. So it seems. Now, over the years then, I've learned the process to flight and the process to peace is one and the same in death. And any time I begin a new inquiry into the question of the social questions, I always frame the question in the context of the pursuit of flight. Or the pursuit of the solution of polio or smallpox or the finding of the gene. For example, it's generally believed the reason we can't live in peace is because the fault lies in human nature. Now, the study of process of flight, we've kind of talked about this, but shows prior to the experience of flight, it was generally believed we couldn't fly because of a fault in human nature. The discovery of flight showed there was no fault flaw in us. We were actually perfect for flying, and we were perfect for solving the problem. And in the end, <coughs> if flight changed our experience dramatically, but it never changed us. We never changed ourselves internally. There it is. Here we are. After flight, we are the same people we were before. <coughs> Mean, nasty, generous, happy, whatever. Same as before. It didn't change us, but it changed our experience dramatically. And if you explore down through history and you go look back at all the processes, like before we solved polio, before we solved smallpox, before we solved agriculture, we believe the problems we had, the things we couldn't understand, were all, we couldn't, they were all on account of there were flaws in us. But any problem we've solved, any advance we've made, has always proved there's never been a flaw in us. And that only opened the question to me to challenge whether there really was a flaw in us. What's we heard? And the answer was, you go look for it and you go find it. But you have to give you a different perspective. You, can, you stop looking, trying to find the flaw in us, and start looking elsewhere to find out maybe there isn't a flaw in us, maybe the solution is elsewhere. That's all that does. Now, evidence like that doesn't prove the path to peace will be the same, and it doesn't prove there won't be a flaw in human beings. But uniformity of experience does build confidence that the better path is to abandon past failure, trying to change human nature, which has never been done, by the way, and follow past success and pursue peace through modifying external structures or our social systems. But the great question remains, what to do? I mean, we do try to change our social system. We have been trying to change them. We've gone from 
brawls to votes, from clans from, from to nations, from we traded our swords for pens, so to speak. I don't think so, though. And we surrendered our hot oil for drones, but we still don't make any advance. So what change should we make and how? And that's always been a big question. And I think the scientific process shows us what changes we need to make. Now, I have another question I'd like to pose to you. If you lived prior to the time of a flight and you had a dream to know how to fly, how would you make flight happen? Now, when people live prior to a time we know peace, like say today, and we have an aspiration to live in peace, what do we do? We protest, we pray, we mount a revolution. Those are the standard recipes for changing the world. Now, it has been an illusion that any of these techniques succeed. For if they did, we would not face the same social problems every generation in the past has faced without exception. Once one person got the solution to polio, it proved out we are not. Once one person got the solution to flight, it turned out we all got it. Once one person learned about zero, it turned out we all got it. It only stands to reason. If one person had ever gotten peace, we would have all gotten it. It's just a, it's just a, a logical assumption. So, if you lived before flight and wanted to fly, would it have been a, mad, a, a rational act? To petition, protest, revolt, pray, or be the change you want it to be? The reason no one was flying because no one knew how to fly. It's just that simple. If they had known, they would have flown. So the question is, would it have brought flight about faster? If we targeted some people, say some people who were working at uh, MIT or whatever that institution was, and had whispered that they were getting close to the sea to fly, would it have brought about flight faster if we'd gone over there and I held some prayer vigils and protested them and maybe carried signs around with witty slogans on them. It's just a question, but I think the answer is no. For one reason, no one at MIT or any other big institution got flight. Flight was gotten by an obscure human being so obscure, an uneducated English lord, so obscure that when he got the solution, all the great institutions wrote him off as being wrong. And that writing it off may have, in fact, slowed down the advance towards the flight by decades. It only took one person. I know how he feels. So. <laughs> My first, tell that story, my first point about it is, if I'm considering a valid a tool, the validity of a tool to cause social change, I always go back and I look and see if it works in flight or in some other changing process, discovery process. And if it didn't, I'm going to place my money. It will not cause a change to our social situation. I also bet if a technique worked, it has the odds are increased that it will be useful for us, to us. Again, if people had known in 1950 how to fly, they would have flown. And I find it, I just find it good to remember if we knew how to live in peace, any of us knew we had gotten a hold of it and we'd all be doing it. Because it's a thing that in one way or another, the great majority of people on this planet 
what he loved from that influence. You figured out the solution, I think they'd pay whatever price it took to get to it. It's the most important thing to a great many people. But nobody knows. You know, you cannot benefit from the airplane, from the ink pen, from the ruler, from the thermometer, until somebody gets it. And that's the pro that's that's my starting point. We have to figure out how to get it. When you look at it that way, there's no one to blame because we can't live in peace, or you have to blame us all because we are ignorant. I think this is going to be the downfall of the occupied movement. Because they know the world is unfair, just like everybody else has. They're in desperate conditions, just like many human beings have been. But they don't know how to cause social change. And they're going to go back, and they're going to use some old recipes. They're going to use these recipes to try to solve their problems. They're not going to solve them. Think about it. In the big picture, Flight is optional. We don't have to learn how to fly airplanes. In the big picture, the piano is optional. We don't have to figure out that, that instrument, if we didn't know it, didn't figure it out, and we didn't have it, and we never knew it, we might not miss it. But we cannot ignore social problems. They're even different than a polio epidemic, because a polio epidemic only impacts a certain group of people. But Social problems of the pack to solve by degrees. But everybody is, you know, they're constant, they affect everyone, they destroy our communities, and they ruin our experience over and over. No one is immune from being killed, robbed, raped at the store, in their backyard. You know, nobody's got immunity from any of this stuff. People spend a lot of money creating barriers to protect themselves from it, but even then they can't guarantee that they will escape our social problems. Every time our social systems crash, every time they fail, we have no choice but to start rebuilding. They are essential to us. We need a way of organizing ourselves. We can't not use social systems. And every time we try to rebuild them, there's a fact is you can only rebuild by the methods you know. And if you don't have a better idea, you have to use the same old idea that was used the time before. Now, you may try to tweak it. You may try to change it. You may try, but, but if you don't know what you're doing, you aren't going to figure it out. We, do, we try to change them all the time. Every church, new church, is a modification of an old church that people left because it failed them. And they start with what they thought worked in that church, and they try to change it so that it works better than the old church did, but in the end it does not work. It's the same with any government. You take the old one, you say, these are the things we like about it, these are the things we didn't like about it, let's make some changes. It still doesn't work. One little nugget of evidence, we don't know how to live in peace, as there currently is no positive definition of peace. All we have is a negative definition, the lack of war or fighting. The prescriptions we have are basically, stop fighting. I'd like to take you back to the time before flight again. When Daring people were actually building machines or maybe strapping wings to their back and jumping off cliffs in an attempt to fly. Could they have learned how to fly simply by deciding it was stupid to crash and burn? Mm. I think the answer is no. Could legislatures have ordered them not to crash? Would that have caused them to fly? Mm. 
Could they have learned to fly simply by agreeing between themselves not to crash? Yeah. <coughs> the answer, I, I, it's, it's, no, you couldn't. The point is, flight is not just not falling or walking. Flight is a thing unto itself. And it's, anything that isn't flight is the crash. And a social system, it, war is just a crash of a social system that failed. It didn't fly, if you want to put it in the term. It is not a thing of itself. It's the result of failure. And some people like to study war and learn how to live in peace. As if there's some secret to human nature and the remains of a war. And I propose to you that's no different than studying the machines that crashed and fell to the bottom of the cliffs to learn how to fly. You can't do it because the information isn't there. It never was, or the machine would never have crashed. Now, one of the things I learned through the scientific process is that human being is a model dependent species. We are a model dependent species. We cannot conceive what we can't perceive. And to give you an example, every child learns a language. But there is no genetic component to language, language except the capacity to learn a language. It doesn't matter who your parents are, what your nationality, where you came from, how much money you have. The language you get is not present, going to be dictated by anything except what the language being spoken to in, the, in your presence at the time you're one, two, and three. That's the language you'll get. You will not get any part of the thousand other languages spoken on this earth. You're only going to get what's brought to you. You'll only get the accents. You'll only get the definition of words. You'll only get the usage of words. And you're also going to get, by this process of observing people speak to you, you're going to get the rules about how to order nouns and, nouns and verbs in your language. And you're going to do it all through a process of observation. You're going to pick it up. When you become really competent with this language, you'll have the ability to do things with that language you never saw it done before. You'll be able to use, make sentences that nobody used in your presence before. If you need to, and you have a reason to, you'll be able to create a new word in that language to describe something nobody else did. But you can't do any of that until you understand the base language. And that is the fundamental way of the scientific process. It's, a pro it's the same process, but you use language is actually the same process that technological and scientific advances come through. It's a process of observing. It's a process of inferring what is causing what you observe, and then it's a process of devising new things as a result of what you observe, of your understanding. And that's what George Cayley did. He observed birds. He inferred the laws of flight out of that, and then he, working with other people to you get to the rights, learned how to build machines that demonstrated they had understood correctly what caused flight. And I argue the way we use language and build airplanes is the template for solving our social problems. And if you doubt a, a scientific study, shows when all the evidence is examined. I'm not staying current here, but when all the evidence is examined, there's always a model that explains, allows scientific advance. Edward Jenner saw a woman, a milkmaid actually, contract cowpox. And then he noticed she observed an immunity to smallpox. And that process allowed him to develop a vaccine 
to smallpox. And that process led to the development of the polio vaccine. Mendel, Mendel had his sweet peas, Newton had his apple, on and on it goes. If you find the evidence, people were working off the models. And sometimes, once you get the first airplane, that becomes the model for the next guy who just makes incremental changes to that. And hundreds of people making incremental changes to a device is a process by which we transition from crude to refined systems. Now, <clears throat> through the study of the process, the modeling process, it became obvious the reason we don't have a positive definition of the peace, the word peace, is because we don't have a model of peace. We really don't know what the hell it is. And now what do I mean by a model? I mean specifically, there is no group acting out peace in front of us that we can study the way our parents, our sisters and brothers, uncles and neighbors acted out language in front of us. There is no group, no society anywhere acting out peace that we can study the way George Cayley studied birds. We are a model dependent species. And models must bear specific characteristics. To be valuable. And I, we can't go into those tonight, but the important point is there is no way in hell we are going to get to peace except we find a model. It's, it's just a problem. You gotta get it or you, you if it, if it doesn't exist, we're out of luck. That would, that would actually show. There's no way in hell. We're, we're not, there are pieces of impossibility. But if we find it, we're on our way in the door. And that's it. Your choice is to go look for the model. I need to skip a few years here. I'd just like to take you out and show you. And here we go. I want to show you a peaceful social system. And we're not going to leave this room to show you this. We'll just conduct what is called a mental experiment, a tool that Albert Einstein showed to be used very successfully to make discoveries. And it won't be difficult to do because all I'm going to ask you to do is let your mind's eye wander out the door, walk down the street to the first busy intersection with traffic lights. I just want you to put yourself there, okay? Good. You there? Now, I know you, because this is the nature of human beings, I know you are a rebellious, uncooperative, irrational, unpredictable human being. Yes, me. I know this because that's the way we are. That's our problem, right? So given that, I would like you to explain your predictable, cooperative, Rusty. Even obedient relationship with this life. What do I mean by that? I mean if you're driving down the street and it's red, you stop. If it's green, you go, you know, you'll go sailing through that intersection at 25, 35, 45, 50 miles an hour, acting as if it's a God-given right for you to go flying through that intersection. Why do you do that? <clears throat> Because we're a right-of-way state, not a uh, duty of care state. Oh, hey. well, let's hear it for Indiana. All right. Now, actually, I always make this mistake. You see, you you're, you're, you're not the uh, irrational, the untrusting, the, the rebellious type. You know, that's always somebody else. That's the them of the world. The us and the them. But we don't have those qualities. It's them that make this, that, that, that cause the world to be such a bad place. They make it so unpredictable. We don't bear those qualities. It's them. There's some reason we're all the same. Now, so given that, now I want you to go back to your intersection. I want you to look around. I want you to watch the traffic moving through there for a few minutes. And I want you to ask, explain to me why more than 99% of everybody who goes through that intersection behaves exactly as you do. They cooperate with that street light. They're obedient with it. 
Where are all these irrational people all of a sudden? Where did they go? I'm messing with a paradigm here. We claim we're uncooperative and distrusting, but our activity around streetlights and in traffic systems reveals exactly the opposite. We have notions before we can cooperate on large scales that we'll have to get past so many barriers of personality and build interpersonal relationships and learn how to accept each other. We have to understand each other. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but you have no relationship at all with anybody you're sharing the streets with, basically. You don't even know they exist. You're not paying any attention to them, and they're not paying any attention to you. Your only concern is living with it. You, you concentrate on the light, you concentrate on the rule that they make you run, you do what's necessary, you pay attention to people around you, in a sense you watch their cars, not them. <coughs> They're doing the exact same thing as you, and everybody's cooperating. Not everybody. 99.9% .9 of the time, this system works. Everybody goes through that line. Everybody succeeds, and it's cooperation. Why is that? Why is that different than a government? So expand, expand this view for a minute. Oh, if we're ever going to get together in peace, we have to agree to work on a common purpose. We have to work it all out. Okay? If this is going to do it globally or in big, you know, we're going to have to make peace that not everybody can get what they want. There's going to have to be some people make sacrifices. Well, let's test some of these ideas. When you got up this morning, I believe it's accurate to say you set some goals today. Some of these goals establish destinations to which you travel on the streets. Maybe to work, maybe to the park, maybe to your parents' house, maybe to your son's house. I'm to this restaurant game. When you get home tonight, it'll be true that you use the street system to accomplish your own individual goals or purposes. That will also be true that everybody else in Chicago did too. Along the way, you did a lot of give and take. You took the green lights and you gave it to red lights. You, know, you may have encountered the, the water man broken in a block that made you go around the block. You, you know, a lot of things can happen on the road. But in the end, you got where you were going, and you accomplished the purposes you set out today, and you didn't get together to negotiate purposes with anybody on the streets, and they did the exact same thing. Everybody achieved what they set out to do on the streets. There was no winners and no losers in that system, per se. There may have been some people who got stupid, and there may have been a couple of tragedies on the streets, it's true. And there may have been some big inconveniences, like wrecks, but at the end of the day, 99.9% .9 of everybody on the streets achieved the objectives that they set out to achieve. We can do it. It's a matter of perspective and understanding what we're doing. Street systems are a successful social system. They can serve as a model to help us explain, understand what successful social systems are. We can gain knowledge of successful social systems through the study of street and traffic systems. And hopefully build successful social institutions like government. The same way we study birds, successful flyers, and learned how to build mechanical flyers, airplanes. But we will have to we have to expose ourselves to a number of observations of the street systems to understand what's going on, the same as we would have to expose ourselves to understand birds, how birds fly, or how languages, what language. You have to get yourself so enmeshed in the system you begin to understand what's causing it to be successful. I say there's enough information 
in a way a successful a street system is successful to understand how to build a successful government. There's almost enough information to understand how to build a successful economy. What's missing that you can't well stop you from building a successful economy is street systems don't allow us to understand the nature of competition. I mean the valid nature of competition, which we know is a real part of human beings, which we know is always going to crop up, but we don't understand how it must be incorporated into a system in order to be successful. And that's what you can learn by studying systems where you find competition as a successful, as a, 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 an element that makes it a successful system. And I'll tell you, the game of football is another successful social system. And you can study that system to understand the valid nature of competition. I'm afraid I'm running out of time. I got 10 minutes, he said. All right. So. We do not have a current definition of social system that is worth a hill of beans. It isn't any better than our current definition of peace. So we're trying to build something we haven't even got a concept on. Thank you. Here's our definition. It's, well, I'm way behind that. Nope. The people in a society considered as a system by a characteristic pattern of relationships. I, I'm not sure, but I think it might say wherever two people interact, you've got a social system. It doesn't talk about anything about what might mark a successful system versus a failing system. It gives you no information. gives you no physical characteristics that you can actually look at and identify what a social system is. It gives you nothing to set an objective against the bill. Allow me, I'll replace it with this definition. A successful social system is a mechanical system that organizes a population to enable that population to cooperate in the achievement of feats that are mutually beneficial to the community. That's what you're looking for. If you had that experience, that would probably be the closest thing you'd say, I'm living in a world of peace. I cooperate, we create, it's beneficial to us, and we mutually share it. That's a definition of a peaceful world. That's what a street system is. It's a physical, mechanical system. It organizes us in a way that allows us to cooperate in the achievement of feats that are mutually beneficial to us. Now what that means is we each have our individual purposes, our own aspirations, and the street system assists us in achieving those. And if we understand that, and that's successful, now we can understand perhaps how we will strive an equitable world but it doesn't have to be the same for everyone. We're not all getting the same out of the street system in terms of the tangible exact circumstance, but we're all getting what we aspire to have out of it. And that's the important point. And if you get what you aspire out of a system, it should be satisfying. But it doesn't mean we all get the same damn thing. And we don't have to say, you know, we don't all have to have, you know, one stick of the wood, one glass of the water, one small bowl of porridge. It doesn't have, that's not what this does. So, I'll ask you why a government <coughs> is a system that rules other people. And I'll say it not because of human nature, because we build systems all the time, street systems, where human beings interact, cooperate, and do not meddle in each other's business. 
That's the beauty of it. We build systems all the time where there are no winners and losers, only beneficiaries. A government doesn't have to be the way it is. It's because of the structure that we create, that we allow a government to be. We can modify that structure to cause government to be more like a street system. If we understand what makes a, successful, a street system a successful system. I'm about to wrap up here with what I'll be able to talk about, but I'd like to show you some successful systems. And these, actually, <laughs> these are successful non-human societies. The atom world, I'm talking about this great big mass of matter that makes up the universe that we live in. It's the most successful social system ever existed. The biology, by definition, now that you have a physical definition, is a successful system, and so is the climate. Now what this, what this goes to show is that we didn't invent social systems. We're not the first social system. They existed. They're as old as the universe. There's nothing new about them. Here's a list of successful social systems. You have to look at that definition and consider it to understand why oral languages, polio vaccines, alphabets and written language, sheet music, football and racing sport, street and traffic systems, airline passenger tra transport systems are successful systems. Now, where these interact with unsuccessful systems like these, governments, economies, political systems, religions, psychology, armed forces, schools, courts, Children's sports leagues, addictive devices, wherever these interact with these, these will start failing. They will not look like the successful systems they are. If you segregate them in the same way you would segregate the systems of an automobile between, say, the uh, fuel system and the electrical system, and you say, treat one as we're working, as we isolate the problem, you know, let's isolate the problem over here. And if you isolate the problem over here, you'll understand this one's working perfectly. <coughs> I asked you about this. How would boys have as much fun as they do if they did not have a structure called a football game? that has rules, it has boundaries, it has objectives. It's a system. It's a mechanical system that exists independently. How are they going to have fun without that system? That's the value of the system. I mean, what are you going to have to do? Sit on a couch and imagine they're having as much fun? They couldn't even conceive it. It's, a, it's just a thought. The history of music, if you go back and examine the history of music, shows that music was, was, was rich and fun as people knew it all through history. It was something they did. But it was slow and plodding and very simple relative to the development of sheet music. Because following sheet music, Music had just exploded in its complexity and its variety. And if we did not have sheet music, we would actually lose the ability to retain the music we have today. We for lost sheet music, even if we kept recordings of all the great symphonies and all the great pieces of music, we would not be able to retain enough information to actually recreate those systems. And for an orchestra or a symphony to go back and recreate that piece. We really wouldn't have enough information. That information is stored in that system. And it's not, it's that sheet music is the thing, the structure, that allows us to cooperate around music.
I have more to say, but I think I've used my hour. I made my argument as good as I can. What's your solution? You 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 said a lot, but uh, is there any specific solution? Uh, we, we should applaud first. Yeah. Well, Okay. All right. Question. Was you you gave us a lot of information on social systems, on the scientific method, on many different aspects, and I'll tell you, I was intrigued and I learned quite a bit. What remedies or solutions do you have to the social system problem? Here they are. These are the three principles of social organization. Talk into the mic. I'm sorry. These are the three principles of social organization. They are derived by studying successful systems. You build systems that incorporate those three principles exactly as you build airplanes that incorporate the laws of the dynamics. And you'll find these systems work. You have to understand these laws. I don't have time to go into it tonight. I'd run to I'd love to get on my soapbox. But this is the answer. You build systems under these. You understand these. You, you learn about these by studying successful systems. You, take, you go to watch football and you say, what's going on there that explains these rules? You go watch street systems and say, what is this? And then you learn how to build systems. You understand. What would you have to do to a government? Okay. Incorporate these rules into it to allow it to work. And we can run models. I can run models if you like. Well, I obviously can't deny it. But you get us, and I can come back, and we could do. We could talk about an election problem, whether we could transform the election, the, the governmental system in the United States. We could run. We could talk about rebuilding the economy. We could explore these rules. We can do all kinds of work. But that's the answer. Now you care. do have a website, correct? Yeah. I do have a website. Yeah. Could you give it to us, please? Yes. It's socialorganizationphysics.com. Now, I'll tell you it's not good yet, but I'm working on it. I'm working as fast as I can. I work by myself. I do all my work by myself. I'm getting it up as fast as possible, but, you know, bear with me. But you can, on this, on this, at the top is my name, address, and my email address. You know, I'm a lonely person. I'm out here crying in the wind. But if you want to talk to me, i got all the time in the world to talk about what I do and why, what we can do. And if you want to contact me at my address at Kurt at socialorganization.com, I'll be happy to talk to you. I'll give you any information I have. I'll provide you any of the background of what I've done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yes, Frank. Yeah. Uh, first, I have to see that... Uh, uh, by you quitting your work and start working on this, uh, your husband and your wife didn't kill you or put you in the mental institution. Not quite, but it was close. <laughs> but uh, since she, she didn't do that, how do you uh, justify that you will be in a system, as you say, that it will be working chaotically and all that? How do you? Uh, organize it in a way that we will be self-sustaining. I mean, I... Self-sustaining. Self-sustaining, because in order to be in peace, as you say here, well, if you define it, you have to be self-sustaining, otherwise it will collapse and we'll end up in, in being a war, right? That's right. So, so the question is, how do how I do justify... Make a, how do you make a system that is chaotic to be self-sustaining? Oh. Oh, you're, are you looking at that? Chaotic process. You have to understand what chaos is and a chaotic system is and what chaotic process is. This is the most ingenious thing that was ever invented. But we try to eliminate chaotic process from our systems. It's necessary. It's essential. It needs to be incorporated. And what a chaotic system is, is nothing. Chaotic systems, when that, when the, 
leader of Egypt says there's chaos in the streets, he's given a bad name to the word chaos, because chaotic systems are not that. They're not the breakdown of systems. They are the defense of systems. They are not systems out of control. They are systems exi exquisitely under control. Okay. But I don't know how to answer your question about the sustainable. I really missed it. I just missed it. Okay. Fellow in black back here, I don't know your name yet. Comrade, your vanguard proposal for peace has a quite a great potential. However, the, the military industrial complex has proven itself to be more than just a toothless paper tiger. Yeah. So with that in mind, how are you going to prepare the masses in anticipation for the reactionary wave from the military industrial complex against your vanguard proposal? Fabulous. I think you don't try to go build government. I don't think you do that. I think you have to start them very small. First, you have to get enough people working on it that they begin to understand the concepts and theory. You build small models to prove it. Then you expand. And I think the first two models you expand to are children's sports leagues and schools. And the reason you go to those is because those are um, risk. They are relatively risk-free models. They allow you to build a small social system. And they exist in such a way that if the system collapses in on you for any reason, everybody can disappear from that system, re-enter their kids back into other sports leagues, or re-enter their kids back into schools. But you would build them against these rules and you would test. You would build confidence on a small level. And I'm telling you, you know, we did not, we did not, I'm going to tell you it's going to happen exactly like the airplane. One person got it. One person invented an airplane, actually two people, five people invented airplanes in two years, working different from each other because they were all working in the same stream. That's important to understand. But when they got it, the human race grabbed hold of it and moved it in. And I don't think you have to organize at the big level. You have to do it, all you have to do is find the solution and prove it. And it'll be so, people will, they'll grab it up and take it home. And that's, but you have to prove it on the basis. Well, let's see. Uh, Binkley, Charles, Jan, and George. Yeah, since Francisco forgot to ask, do uh, you think that uh, religion is responsible for a lot of the uh, lack of peace in the uh, last 2,000 years in the war? Well, no more than capitalism, no more than anarchy, no more than communism, no more than, no more than anything else. I don't think, no more than anything else. It's just a failed system. It, and it has, it, it's a very logical system. And a lot of people will tell you that, I don't know what your school is, but you know, a lot of people will argue that religion is some throwback from a, ancient ages that's a superstitious thing passed down through our genes or something. It isn't. It's a very valid system today. And people use it for a very specific reason. It's explainable. And it's partly explainable by the way the human brain is built. But I don't have time to go there, so I'm not going to. All right. Uh, Charles? All right, uh, Kurt, I'm looking over your list here. <laughs> successful non-human societies. Yes. Oh, biology, that's a real success. Why don't you ask the, the mouse that my cat's going to eat tonight? <laughs> How successful, and climate. I think last week some guy's house was torn apart by a tornado while he was taking a bath. Uh, Adams. All right, I'm getting to it. Adams. <laughs> I, that's like the atomic weight thing is like goofy. And language is successful. There's hundreds of them and guttural, goofy languages. These are successful. What's a successful part of this stuff? What the hell are you asking? Yeah. So, right, let's go back to that. Let's find it. successful biology. Let's find out where that is. A successful social system is a mechanical system that organizes a population to enable the population to cooperate in achieving a feature that are mutually beneficial for the population. Let's look at a polio vaccine. Before the polio vaccine, people like were frightened of their I neighbors chose. when polio was in town. I like they, the ones it, I tore, it destroyed their social structure. You create the polio system, the polio vaccine, and it enables the people to cooperate in ways they were not able without the vaccine. Good. Let's go. Um, 
Eating the mouse that's going back to your... Okay, here's, here's one of the problems. To I, I'd like to I'll address your, pro, your, your question on the biology. Okay, you're right. Animals eat each other. Okay? We've been using that as a model for human social structures because we haven't had a very valid model. We've been imagining that because we watched cats eat mice and and wolves run in packs, and uh, we have these myths about the lion as the king of the jungle, that we needed to organize this way to solve our problems. And that, I'm going to tell you, is no different than looking at birds, seeing birds flap wings, and thinking the way to fly is to strap wings on our, on our back and try to fly. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is you have to look to the purpose of the system. And we didn't explore purpose. A lot of people don't think purpose can be explored scientifically, but purpose can be explored by the scientific process no differently than flight if you know how to pursue it. And the purpose of the system dictates what mechanical behavior is appropriate within that system. And the purpose of the system, the biology, justifies the use of the eating and being eaten process. But when you look at the purpose of the human race, and, and if you study it, that behavior is responsible for causing the sustainable, continuous behavior of that system. And when you incorporate that behavior in the human social systems, you see an exact opposite effect. It causes the collapse of systems. But you have to understand, you have to view from a system. You can't just say that is a fit, that causes this to be an unsuccessful system. It is absolutely an unsuccessful system in the context of its purpose. Follow up. Oh. One quick one. <clears throat> when I go home, I'm going to use the scientific process to use something called a mouse trap. Because I'm in the biological community. Yep. And I don't think the mice should occupy my community. Why? Right. <laughs> There's no law that says it should. So, that's a successful system? The biology is a successful system. It is. Allows me to kill. Oh, but poor little well, I can't. <coughs> I can't. I can't dance. <laughs> Damn. Is it my turn? Yes, yeah. I am. Um, I, I wanted to tell you about uh, this. I, I don't watch TV, but I did happen to watch the last episode of The Paper Chase. This is a question for you. Yeah. You have a question. And there'll be comment period afterwards that you can comment. Okay. A question. <laughs> Next. All right. We'll come back. All right. Jess. Uh, George. <coughs> I don't think I've changed my name yet. Um, <laughs> what is the purpose of conflict? I'm sorry? What is the purpose of conflict? What's the purpose of a crash of an airline? No, answer my question. I, I'm, I'm going to ask you. I don't answer the okay, question. I'm going to ask you one. Okay. The, there is no purpose to conflict. Well, it's, oh, it's, the, it's the failure to be able to build a successful system. No, there is a purpose to conflict. The purpose is to maximize resources. Conflict is brought about from the microbial level on up, if you want microbes and mammals, to, to a question. dirt. No, no, I asked a question, but you know, the point is, the purpose is to maximize resources. Since you couldn't answer my answer. Uh, Bill was the yeah, uh, Is there any peace between the union and staffs and bosses? You might have to say that's a heavy conflict there. We haven't been around here too much. So I mean, we've had a statement here that happiness is a, is a warm baseball bat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Big line is the same. Joe Mayer and then uh, uh, Bob Mack. Okay. <coughs> the first of your three principles of social organizations seems to be somewhat self contradictory. 
Uh, you say the design exists in advance and independent of the organization and execution of the design. Right. It seems like it's chasing itself. Certainly is. And where, where the more. Let's go. Design exists in advance and independent of organization and execution of design. And you study. You have to set up, you have to design a system. You design a street system, you design it against a purpose. You construct it against that purpose. And it's only when it's constructed that you actually execute it or put it in motion. And when you do this, it's the description of, there is a relationship between design of a system, the development of that system, and the execution of the system. You study by studying the way they, why anything was made, how the airplane was made. You first have to design your system, you build it, then you execute that. If it fails, you study what happened, you, you redesign, you rebuild it, and you execute it again. You study that, you redesign, you rebuild it, you execute again. And I'm going to tell you that, and it's, a, it's an important one, because look at the way we build governments. We don't create a design and then find or establish a purpose and a method to create that, reach that purpose in the building of a government. What we do is we elect individuals give them all kinds of power, all kinds of money, and we let them set their own damn agenda to do whatever they want once they get in office. And that's a violation of that principle. Nobody who ever took an office in a, bat, in, a, in a successful social system would ever be able to convert the resources to, a, to an objective which they set of themselves. Going back, you are certain, because everything that happens here has to go back to you. And a a follow-up question on that, if I may. Uh, that seems to be rather an engineering approach rather than a scientific approach. Well, I wouldn't know the difference between science and engineering. Uh, I, I believe they carry, I believe that, you know, uh, one, the they, they, they airplanes, they'll say, uh, there's a, the, the, the physicist was done when he figured out his laws and the technologist took over and built the machine. But they, you, they, you couldn't have done one without the other. I don't know where the difference is. Okay. That's my answer. Bob Lass. Okay, uh, you brought up this, this point of uh, politicians doing what they want to do once they get in office. So we can recognize that as a, as a problem. Uh, do you think something more mechanical, like uh, direct participation of of the uh, of the population, like maybe having us vote via the internet on individual bills or something, take, taking the politician out of the picture, just letting the people vote directly on everything, which would be a more mechanical solution? But would you think that would be better? I mean, that's more or less guaranteeing the will of the people, is it not? Um, you have to play all three rules together at the same time. You can't just take one rule and say, well, we'll change this one. You have to understand them all at once. You're getting, you are getting close, you know, in a sense. But actually, voting, and you have to understand this, the voting by any process is the ability of a majority to impose their will on another part of the community. One of the parts of a successful community is it recognizes that every that every, every individual member of a population in a successful social system is a self-willed human being. They're a self-interested human being. And the system in that in motion has to defend self-will and self-interest. And that's what happens on the streets. Everybody, the reason a street system is successful is because every human being is taking care of themselves, choosing their own way, going about their own purposes, and they're not imposing their will on other human beings. Everyone has a right of will on the streets. You have to learn how to set that in a system. You cannot use a vote of any type, but there are ways to build systems that you don't need to. You'd still be people, if you, you do need to get a, a peer process. 
What's your name? I, I have a, 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 a some every follow up here. Uh, um, after, you know, at the end of World War II, we dropped a couple of, of atomic bombs on Japan, and they we haven't had any trouble with them since. The pieces, they haven't attacked anybody since, since that. So that, so that worked, didn't it? Using, uh, I mean, that was that, that's a way to peace, right? I mean, you just... Well, let's see. Um, right now, I believe every nation on Earth is at war. Some of them are directly involved in war. Some of them prompt them through war. Some of them prompt in really strange ways through war. There isn't a peaceful nation on earth, not even the Japanese. They're hosting our armies, which allows us to wage war in other parts of the world. I'm not sure that's, and the world is just, is under the greater threat of self-destruction today than it's ever been in the past. I'm not sure that's a valid state. But, you know, I, I. All right. The gentleman behind Charles. Comrade, uh, to, to what extent... I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Oh, Richard. 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 Uh, Comrade, to, to what extent will your Vanguard proposal for peace work just as well with an economic system that's based on debt financing as opposed to an economic system that's not based on debt financing? Will it make a difference either way? If you build a, a social, we understand we need a social system of peers. If you build a social system of peers, the interesting thing is we understand we need a social system of peers, and this goes back to this first rule: design exists and advances. No, that organization execution design. We want a system of peers. We know we want that. But if you look at the design of our government, it doesn't even get close to being a system of peers. But we keep saying, we're going to use the design we have, and we'll ask these people to create a system of peers. Now, if you can, you have to build a, a social system that creates a system of peers, you'll find out whether debt financing okay. is valid or not. But until you build that, you won't know. I'm sorry, that's the answer. Very nice. Oh, Charles? Yeah, Kurt, you yeah. keep talking about the principles of flight as a, an indication of the success of the scientific method. How many people in, since 1903 or around then have perished mm -hmm. in this perfect system for arriving at the truth? <laughs> well, and I understand that... Well, I had to look it up the other day. One person dies every eight minutes because of the failures of the system at a stoplight. Titanic. Uh, these are hardly perfect systems. I mean, why not? If you learn how to fly, why are planes crashing? You're all being really made in China. If you study the systems. <clears throat> well, let's start here. <clears throat> I don't ever say a perfect system would create eternal life for human beings. That's not my objective. Human beings, human beings are biological creatures. We are creatures of genius. We have incredible talents. We also can make mistakes. We are going to continue to die. People are going to continue to die in accidents. But if you talk about the difference between 99% failure rates in systems and less than 1% failure rates in systems, you have made a lot of success. Much of this traffic, there is a death every eight minutes at the traffic light. I'm not going to argue about that. But I will argue that that's not a fault of this a lot of that is not the fault of the street system, you know. A lot of that, some of that has to do with people who get drunk and inebriated and make bad mistakes. Well, and that not is part not, of the system. That is not yeah. a part of the traffic they're system. Aliens. That is, That is a different system integrating with the traffic system. You solve the problem, that problem, you might solve, you might see the death rate go down on the streets. You have to understand which system is causing the failure. Is the system that takes the life of someone every eight minutes uh, a successful one? Yes, it is, Charlie, uh, because it gets you from point A to point B, is what he's trying to say. Uh, so the population. Yes. John? 
Yes, Kurt. Um, we've been speaking tonight about human nature and human beings in relatively general terms. I was curious in your research if you've uh, looked at the cultural components to social organizations and how different cultural factors might affect uh, any solution that you were trying to construct. Mm -hmm. I did to the degree I determined there was no successful social system on the face of the earth. But I'm, I'm thinking in terms of your solution, though, are, yeah, are you going to be looking at how cultural factors would influence it? If you figured out how to do this, everyone could build their own system. I mean, these rules the same way. So it would be I mean, culture neutral, then, is what there, you're saying. It would yes, work anywhere, there are, anywhere, anytime. There's one set of laws pertaining to flight. Right. Count how many different kinds of airplanes are in the sky. Right. You can expect that any group of people could build their own system. As long as it conformed to this, it could look different and unique to that group and it would, would accomplish for them and it would integrate with any other system built like these, just as all the airplanes we have integrate with any other system. So it would be cultural neutral. Mm -hmm. Now, I point out to you that you can go anywhere in the world and if you know how to use street lights and street signs and things and roads, you can just about drive anywhere in this world or you're going to have to adopt cultural differences because we, we have basically found a successful system and we have incorporated it around the world. With deviations, you get there, you learn them, you can operate. So you may see more, a draw uniformity, but it will still be quirky. So it doesn't have to, you're not talking about building one giant global system. You're just talking about building systems that conform to these laws. Tim Bolger. All right. You know, where, you know, I, I see a lot of systems of street lights and things like this. I mean, don't we have another one called the Internet with uh, the protocols of HTTP that work quite well, too? Sure. Yeah, I haven't right. examined that one because... But that was not really people interacting in a way that I'm looking for to see how they interact up, 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 interact against each other and have to get up. I mean, you can do a lot of things on a computer without even getting in a person near them. And you can't do that on streets or in airlines. You're talking about where people are actually interacting with each other, physically interfacing with each other, and being able to cooperate. So that's why I study those. Okay. It's hopefully early. I think we can. Let's uh, get the rebuttals. Well, I got a. In our social system, he's the guy in charge. I see. Let's go to questions, Brian. Let's go to rebuttals. Bro. Whose hand is up here? The question ain't nothing if it ain't wasted. All right, Bob Matter. Uh, yeah, yeah no, the way I understood you at the, at the beginning, and I think in, in, the, in, the, in the description, you said you had uh, three laws of physics. No, okay, so you're calling those laws of physics. I don't really understand number two there. Can you, can you kind of clear me up on that one? Sure. Go back out and watch the street system and watch how everybody that gets on the street system chooses when they will get on where they will go, and how they will behave the whole time they're on there. Every other person will do the same thing. You can only choose for yourself, self-select, how you will operate. You can't choose how the person next to you will operate. You can do something that will cause them to react to you, but you never take over their experience. They will react to you, and you will react to them. That's self-selection. That's choosing for self. And the whole system runs on that. And that's what makes it possible. If you start putting managers on the street to decide where you move and you move and you move and you're going you to try to sort this, your system would collapse. It would actually fall apart. You'd have people that, you know, parallel parking would be a thing in the past because it never get done because you'd be waiting on somebody to tell you what to do next. And people just drop their cars and walk off the streets in a fit of rage. It works because of self-selection. That's, I mean, you have, just have to look at it. Okay. I have a question, and I haven't had a question before, <laughs> yeah. so therefore, what, uh, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that all of these failed social systems that you've mentioned 
have had their successes and their failures. Care of that. And uh, that's why alternates have been uh, evolved. Um, well, uh, you, have to you have to establish what the purpose of a system is. And then you have to assess whether any system well, achieved that purpose. Uh, purposes uh, informing the system. So right. So you, where do we go? Here. There you go. You have to define this. You have to measure whether it did this. Did any of those systems? Well, did it allow a population to organize to enable the population to cooperate in the achievement of feats that are mutually beneficial? Yes. Uh, Gene? Uh, Anderson. My question is, uh, are you trying to reach the individual uh, to reaching all individuals? In other words, your system, is that for the individual? Is that for the total population? In other words, I'm supposed to look at these uh, mechanical physical thing that I can uh, that, that I can uh, choose no. in order to no. be quality, uh, more confident among my fellow man no. for all our benefit. Are you are you saying that all of us can do this? Or each individual can do this? I believe the answer is one and the same. You cannot, you, you understand the nature of a system and a successful system. And you think about it. What, for down labor backwards, social systems create their outgroups. And those outgroups attack the social system and cause the downfall of the social system. If you create an outgroup, you're going to have a problem that's going to destroy your social system. You can't afford to create an outbreak. Therefore, you have to treat a system that doesn't create outbreak. The only way you can create outbreak, not have a system that doesn't create outbreaks, is not creating people who are not able to experience the benefits of the mutual cooperation. So it's for everybody. But you don't impose it on people. You build the system. Okay. It would, it would work. Bob? Lichtenberg and then Bernie and Yeah, I'm still very much in the dark about uh, how any of this will help us get peace. Uh, seems to me that you're trying to use the scientific method on society as your means. Um, but then I see little of that method that's applicable to humans whatsoever since humans aren't mostly physical things. Uh, at least not what's important in them. What's important in them is values like peace. And isn't peace and value that you can't capture with the scientific method? Are you trying to use the scientific method? Um, and, and doesn't that method, in pure science, doesn't that reduce humans to mere means to be manipulated? Mere things, mere objects. If you go only by scientific method, that's what you end up with. And the method, the scientific method, because it uses us as things, objects, means, um, will end up causing more problems than it solves. Greater problems which you can't solve. Like, for example, computers. Okay. They just messed our minds up. <laughs> the baloney. I guess I, would, I, would, I, I perceive you saying, wouldn't we just. We, tip, we do have fears of the scientific method because the scientific method has been used as a means of destroying human beings, of manipulating us. So you're asking, you're, that, but that doesn't have to be the solution. Now, I don't have any interest in controlling anyone's life. In fact, I got a different interest. I got an interest of living in a world where I neither have to be controlled, nor I neither, and I don't. I don't have to control anyone to be safe, and I don't need, and I don't have to suffer from being controlled by anyone. The only way I can get that is to create, figure out a system that nobody.
has to be controlled to be has to gain control of others to be safe and can't doesn't have to worry about being controlled by others. That's the only way I can get it. I can't get peace by controlling you. I have to figure out a world where you will leave me alone. And that's true of everybody. So I'm not trying to figure out how to dominate your life, order your life, think your life through. In fact, I'd be willing to tell you that I can make a government and show you how to build it. I don't be a thing like an airplane. I'd be able to show you how to build it. You could walk away. You could put anybody in that government you want, and it would turn into the most fantastic thing you ever saw. But I wouldn't choose one person to go in it. And because it doesn't, that's, you apply these laws, you find out that you can do that. People are rational, they are intelligent, they'll make decisions when they're in situations that these laws are there. Now, I don't know if that answers your question, but. What about that? Right. Right? <coughs> After, um, you know, isn't peace a value? Isn't peace what we ought to do? And how can the scientific method tell us that? The scientific method is all about controlling others, controlling the world and humans. Yeah. I believe the scientific method is about understanding the world we live in. Oh, no, control. Oh, no, engineering. Mm, it's about organizing. The scientific method is about learning to organize matter. Uh, okay. Well, I, yes, uh, Charles. Oh, Bernie, Bernie, excuse me. Okay, your system seems imperfect, and if we compare this to the traffic light uh, comparison that you've been using all along, uh, there's just a lot of drivers out there that don't obey these things. I'm out there every day and I see this. And it seems to be getting worse. Yeah, they have yellow cars with numbers on them. <laughs> 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 You've got to look at your systems and which one is causing that problem. You've got to look at how people grow up and learn to hate this world and learn to take it out on other people. You give them a place of people do not people act in their best interest, guaranteed. People are self interested. Every person there's no irrational person on the face of this earth. And we could go through this and we could discuss both of them. If they don't have brain damage, it's impossible for a human being to be irrational. When a person destroys a system, we can talk about this, you want to do the whole night on that, we can do that. But when a person destroys a system, they believe it's in their best interest. That's also anybody who goes out and destroys a system, that behavior has been modeled to them as a way to solve their problems. And they're adopting a model that someone has told them will work for them. You see these bicycle people going through red lights all the time. <laughs> uh, I can't. Because they don't have traffic signals. Yeah, Kurt. Yeah. You take the scientific method and you arrive at something called technology. And applied technology involves something called, well, in the everyday world, the practitioner is something called value engineering. And technology has, involves all sorts of ethical decisions. We're confronted with that. Uh, you guys know that we're discussing that at the Atheist Club. I mean, you, you, technology presents us with the dilemmas because we have to make decisions. You have to take the health, health work, the technology that comes in, and there's debates about life and death situations. And scientific method doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with arriving at the determination such as a simple thing as value engineering. It is only a means, but it doesn't give us the end. If I build an airplane out of wood or metal using the same scientific method, Tell me which one I should do. I don't want to fly in your airline. Well, 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 you choose. Uh, me. All right. What? Let's go to rebuttals. Let's go to rebuttals. I mean, how, do you, how do you make the decisions using the technological knowledge that you have? What do you do with it? It's not value neutral. All right. 
No, it isn't. But, you know... I mean, do I use my medical technology to save lives, or do I create a Frankenstein? <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using a scientific method. You were talking about using the scientific method in the context of failed social systems. You were talking about using the scientific method in the, in the context of a system where some people system. will prevail, some people will suffer as a result of that prevailing. And you're talking about using the scientific method in a world where you either get eaten or you eat to eat people. You solve that problem, most of what you're talking about is going to dissipate. We have, some, we have a series of social problems. We have poverty, we have climate change, we have an energy crisis, we have cancers that are caused by human-induced processes. They're all social problems. They are social problems because they all result from human interaction. They're actually not problems. They're symptoms. Now, they are the same thing as what appeared in polio when you saw fevers and you saw nausea and you saw paralysis. You cannot solve polio by, by trying to treat the fever. You can't do it. You can reduce the fever, disguise it, but you can't solve the problem of polio. You can't solve any of these problems unless you solve the social problem. When you solve the problem of polio, you solve all the symptoms of polio, like nausea, paralysis, and fever, disappear. They don't even have to be dealt with. You solve the problem of the social problem, you'll see so many problems disappear. You won't have to deal with them. You'll be able to concentrate on the ones that remain. It's a hard argument to comprehend, I know, it's, but trying to sort all these little minutiae issues in a, is like trying to sort out, you know, how to make a plane crash better. And you can't. You have to learn how to fly. You don't crash anymore, and you don't have the problems that come with crashing. One follow-up. Science, oh, oh, science, oh, science, oh, 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 science gave us the vaccination. Wait a minute. Science gave us the vaccination. How do we get it around the world? Technology. Technology and systems. UPS. <laughs> what yeah. do you do if Union you're living in Syria? And the government is shooting at your neighbors. Uh, yes, sir. It's been uh, the same government for 40 years. Uh, 40 years is a success in a way. But, you know, uh, a lot of people have lost their lives uh, to maintain this, uh, this uh, peaceful regime. You maintain uh, and, uh, what, uh, what, how do you apply your scientific method in, in the, the context of an ongoing uh, fracas? You might not like this answer, but I'm going to go with Jonas Salk on this one. Jonas Salk hit town in the middle of a polio epidemic. And there were a lot of children that were dying of that disease, but he didn't spend his time trying to fix every one of those children, protect them, and defend them. He went out and he got ahead of the problem. He went to the laboratory and he solved the problem. And he didn't solve the problem of any of those children. That was too late. That was the crash. That was the crash of the airplane already in motion and it just the results were going to be what they were. He got ahead of the problem. He solved the problem and there were no more of those problems to be dealt with. But you cannot undo what's in, it's just a crisis already made. And that's what we try to do. We try to get in there and make these crises better. What we've got to do is get ahead of them so they don't occur, period. And, you know, all the grief of yesterday will be there. And that's the only answer I can give you. Okay. Right. Uh, uh, but also. Let's see. Uh, uh, Macker and Bernie, uh, but that's the end of it. Uh, we're going to a rebuttal period. <laughs> 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 Would you call yourself a pacifist? No. Yeah? No. No? No. You come to my house and break into it, I'll probably blow your head off. <laughs> 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 you threaten my wife, I'll probably destroy you. That's just that simple.
Bob Barney. And just okay, my final question. It's, it's been brought up by uh, the term engineering as opposed to scientific. It seems like you uh, would be trying to engineer a way to uh, solve our social issues. Uh, and it just, I, know, I get the feeling that this is something that is just way too big to try and engineer by even a lot of people all at once. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to put this in words, but I think you get what I'm trying to say. I'm sorry? I'm trying to formulate what I'm trying to say in this. Okay. It just, this seems too big of a task to, for one simple solution, or even set of solutions. Could you comment on that? Um, one simple solution to solve polio. One simple solution to solve flight. Nobody created a global transportation system. No individual did. The human race did it. The human race got behind one simple idea and they replicated it over and over and over and over again. People replicate process. They get a hold of it, they see it, they improve it. No individual made all the improvements to flight. There are so many people that got into it. One guy made a sloppy little airplane. People, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people worked to create airplanes that are now the supersonic transports that travel the world. But no individual did it. Everybody got behind it. So you don't have, you just have to figure it out, you know, you, you, you learn how to mark one second and you can make a clock that will mark you to the universe. That's all you have to do. All right. The solutions were motivated by profit to the individual who was pursuing it, building a better airplane. Uh, what do you do about problems where pursuing the self-interest is not in the interest of the group as a whole, such as climate change? Well, it, it behooves me to generate power using coal because it's cheaper. But it hurts the group as a whole because it pollutes the atmosphere. <laughs> There's a phenomenon called the unseverable outcome. Oh, I haven't talked about it yet. But it's what makes airplane flight extremely, extremely safe. And that is we can all get on an airplane. Now, there's one guy driving this thing. Okay? And you and you describe him as a hero. When he does something and you saw, you know, you go in a storm and this guy becomes a hero because he got you through the storm. But here's the deal. You're all sitting in a single craft. You're all in chairs. We're all in chairs. He's got the cockpit. You don't need a hero up there. You just need a guy who is so damn self-interested in his life and loves his life so much he'll do. He'll get that crap on the ground safely. If he doesn't get it on the ground safely, he doesn't live. But if he gets it on the ground safely, everybody lives. And he doesn't need a hero. You need a very self-interested person to drive that plane. The reason to apply it to climate change. Okay. To apply it to the climate reason change. you don't have you have different people on this climate change issue is because you created social situations of several severable outcomes where individuals can make decisions where they benefit at the expense of other people. You can't create that in an airplane. You understand that now. Now you understand you create a social structure where people who are operating that what is the cannot social structure create several outcomes. What is the social structure you're talking about that encompasses us and China and India and Europe? No, I'm sorry you ought to say that. What is the social structure you're talking about that encompasses us, China, India, Europe? Thank you for if, if you saw the subject, if you, if you Right here, if you had a social system that worked for you, people in China would adopt it. They wouldn't adopt it exactly. They want the same thing you want. And this is one of the things. Why would you, why would you say oh, that? Next. Why would they say, you say that? Why would China want the same thing I would? What China wants is to get generate power. Well, let's do that. Let's get the rebuttals. Yeah. Let's get All right. the rebuttals. We are now moving to our rebuffal period. Yeah, you can sit down and we get the we pay. About to be imparted. Uh, we're getting with Joe Mayer. Uh, let's see, how many 
people do we have participating? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, at least ten. Thirty-five uh, so minutes. What the difference should say? Five minutes. 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 Five min
the system will collapse precipitously if we use those weapons. Uh, so we have been thinking with others about this that you propose in a system that will be self-correcting, that will take into consideration the human behavior, which, as we know, is, 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 is just uh, uncontrollable in the sense that we are brutal, we are uh, aggressive, uh, and, and, and we, uh, since we cannot control ourselves, then we have this uh, belief in the, in the outer world, you know, God is going to save us, or is going to correct us, because Daddy is going to hit us in the head. Well, that doesn't work, as we see, every, every religion produces the same thing, more, more murders and more, uh, you know, destruction and so on and so forth. Capitalism uh, has made uh, a, a great, uh, it, it was successful, it was successful in creating all this plastic shit. But, but so it's successful in a way that it doesn't take in consideration that this has to be a self-sustaining system. Capitalism is not self-sustaining because it consumes beyond the ability of the earth to, to supply this needed energy and needed to sustain that system. The system doesn't take in consideration the human needs or the needs of the environment, the seas, and so on and so forth. We are, uh, as we know, 40% of the plankton that produce the oxygen that we breathe in is, have been depleted in the, in the Antarctic in the last 10 years. Now, how can we sustain that type of destruction? The acidification of the sea is preventing little creatures that form their calcium uh, shells to, to form it. Now, what, how, how we sustain a, a system that needs all the species on the sea to maintain the, the liability of everybody? Uh, I, I, I think we need to think very hard in a ways to channel our own uh, ways of doing things into a more positive and peaceful way. Okay. Uh, I was uh, probably back when I was speaking with you with the speech at the beginning of the speech today, I was thinking like, well, hey, he's talking about chemical stuff and human stuff and you mix it in that. But I realized later on listening, because I'm listening, and not talking. Uh, the speaker knew uh, exactly what he was trying to say. In fact, if he uh, took that a little bit, he might be able to pass it off as a thesis for a PhD. I mean, he wasn't talking about apples. He was talking about onions. And y'all asked some questions about apples. Now, man, I understand exactly what he's saying. Because he talked to a person that they just lack he thinking. And that is, man ain't shit because he allowed another man to tell him he ain't shit. When you realize that you are a human being, capable of being what a human being is supposed to be, including responsible with some kind of moral sensibility. Now, Kat said that there are ways of knowing a priori. Ain't nobody got to tell you shit. Why? Because you're a human being. He also said, you do unto others as you want them to do unto you. That ain't what he said, exactly what he said. <clears throat> you will that what you do become a universal law, and so forth. Each man should be his own moral legislator. You don't need no other man to tell him shit. Now, why are you thinking you need other people to tell you shit? It's because they done told you already that you wasn't shit. They said in the Bible, when, uh, when, uh, when uh, Adam ate the apple, and that's what they called it back then, apple. But anyway, uh, he said, from now on, you ain't shit. If you're going to get here, that's the, 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 the old version in the Old Testament. Then you got the Christian version. You ain't shit. And you ain't going nowhere and be shit until you come to Jesus Christ and the Lord and all that other bullshit. <laughs> now, everywhere, every time, you got to be straightened out because, oh, oh, not you. It's them, but 
We don't have to have a social contract here in order that everybody get along. Fuck it. That's another human being. That's another human being you're capable of rising as an individual to the level that the speaker was talking about. And he ain't the only one. I'm not the only one. If you listen to St. Paul, guess what he said? He said, when I was a child, I thought I was a child, but I'm no longer a child. I pushed that uh, child stuff aside. What did he say? He said, I'm leaving the Truman Show. What man said to me ain't shit. Descartes said it take me 40 years to get over what the folks telling me back then. And he stepped down. He also said that it's better than a child come up alone than to be subject to the misguiding of the elders and the conflicting opinion of so-called experts. The poet Cahill de Bron, when they asked him about the children, he had the poet tell the lady, said, listen, miss, the children come through you, not from you. Give them your they come through you, not from you. Give them your love, but not their thought, because they have their own thought. As long as the few can take control of the masses and feed you a bunch of bullshit, then they're going to be just like the majority of the people you see. I'm like Descartes. I'm like St. Paul. And everybody else can be like Plato said in his uh, in Mino when when, when when he showed that man is born with the uh, with, uh, innate abilities. He don't need nobody to lead him around. A man will do the right thing at the right time for the right reason if it wasn't for the few using his monkey ass. And he will ceremony tomorrow. And so does woman. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I appreciate the uh, speaker very much, uh, all the work he did to uh, uh, compose this uh, talk. It's uh, far more organized than the usual talk we have here. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very, very respectful of that, uh, and I appreciate all the information uh, uh, and all of his uh, uh, thoughts on this matter. Uh, it's a very difficult and complicated subject. Uh, I wish that his um, uh, presentation was more detailed. It really wasn't scientific, uh, Joe uh, Meyer points out. Um, science involves uh, a hypothesis and trying to uh, find evidence and trying to do experiments to uh, you disprove the hypothesis if you can. Um, and uh, this really can't do that. This is, there is a science of societies, and it's called sociology. There have been many people that have done studies of uh, war and peace. Uh, it involves uh, uh, looking at uh, the history of that, uh, and we haven't seen a great analysis of that here. We see an analogy here uh, to studying uh, the, the uh, history of human flight and attempts to do human flight. Uh, actually, uh, people had flown in gliders. Um, uh, the real problem with the, 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 Bright, the two problems that the Wright brothers uh, satisfied was the lack of controllability, um, and Joe points out uh, a fatal crash, and there were other crashes. Uh, a guy named Langley had a problem uh, with the, uh, a, a, a craft that he developed that uh, crashed in the Potam Potam Potomac, Potomac River um, uh, shortly before the Wright brothers were successful. But they, they also had the advantage of working in a bicycle shop and having uh, a special engine that was uh, lightweight that they developed. So that was one. So these are these are very specific things. Uh, they found the control uh, method uh, for the wings, wing warping, and that was successful. And they avoided a crash uh, in the first flight, which was very lucky. Uh, they had a very short flight, and uh, later on, one of them was killed in a uh, lack of control. Uh, could be, could have been the wind, uh, whatever. He he crashed and died uh, uh, shortly after the 1903 uh, flight. Uh, so that was a tragedy if that had occurred in 1903, then you might never have ever heard of them. Um, so um, basically, there, these are very specific details to that history of flight. I don't know that they actually appertain to uh, the history of the study of uh, war and peace. Uh, there are many examples in history as you go through. Uh, there were periods during our history in Europe, there was a long period of time where war was the sport of kings. I remember. Uh, learning about this in college, uh, where uh, although the wars occurred, they occurred, uh, they were basically games that were played 
um, and uh, very few casualties occurred during the uh, uh, during the battles um, because um, everyone accepted the fact that the wars were really just uh, a sport, as it were, and uh, small parts of the countries were changed hands at the end of when there was a peace treaty. Then we had the, the nationalistic wars, which came about as a result of the French Revolution. So this is a lot of stuff, uh, a tremendous amount of information that he just skips over, and uh, a real scholar of uh, war and peace throughout history would have at least uh, presented some of that information. We know, uh, of course, um, that the First World War did not have to happen. Uh, there were a whole lot of uh, circumstances that were specific to that period of time, uh, treaties that had been um, uh, negotiated uh, between the great powers. Um, and at one point, um, you know, Russia decided to mobilize, and that has been cited uh, as being maybe one of the causes. But even after that point, there were ways to get out of the war occurring. If that war had not occurred, the Second World War, the seeds for it would not have existed. Also, with the peace after the First World War had been negotiated with some wisdom and intelligence rather than simply punishing Germany. Germany wasn't in, the only one responsible for First World War. It was all of these contingencies. If there had been some wisdom involved, uh, it, that is a problem, but uh, it, it means that if the people had been more intelligent after the First World War in negotiating this peace, the seeds for the Second World War might not have, have been um, uh, sown. Um, then, of course, we have the uh, example of the uh, this Cold War that uh, we have uh, uh, at least mitigated, and we're not in a big uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union, although maybe the Republicans want to bring that back, I don't know. Uh, we had hints of that. But uh, we, we've survived that. Um, that, again, also is a whole lot of specific things that we've been lucky about in this case. Uh, if, if we've been unlucky as they were with the First World War occurring because of certain unique circumstances that occurred then, our unique circumstances, we've been very lucky. We, we had one gentleman uh, in the Soviet Union named Stanislav Petrov who actually prevented us all from being killed probably in 1983 when there was a malfunction in the uh, uh, Soviet uh, detection, so-called detection of a missile attack, which showed all of a sudden on uh, his screen, and luckily he was in charge at that time, and he said, well, this must be a malfunction, because the United States would not just make a first strike. So he prevented um, the order being given. He did not give the order, and he resisted other people who said, you should order a strike against the United States so we don't lose our missiles. The missiles seem to be coming, and he prevented that work. So there's a whole lot of specific instances of how uh, war and peace um, needs to be analyzed uh, from a scholarly standpoint uh, historically. Thank you. Good evening. Kurt, thank you for presenting this um, position, if you will. Uh, certainly, peace is a very difficult thing to handle. Uh, there are too many, too many um, theories in, on this point, and while I do have um, some points to make, I thank you for coming, and you certainly uh, uh, induced a fair amount of thought here in the people, and thank you very much for doing that. Um, with respect to your scientific, uh, scientific examples, in my humble opinion, Jenner was an accident. He did recognize it and use it, but any extrapolation from his work would not have done very well. Um, vaccines, unfortunately, do not always work. Sometimes they have some very, very serious consequences. And I think you need to look into those uh, because the medical attitude at this point is everybody should be vaccinated. And my experience and understanding of the system is this is not a great idea. Um, flight has already been said. Uh, you know, there were quite a few things, and the lighter than air flight experience that existed prior to the heavier than air attempts really did lend some information to that problem. Um, Mendel would be at, would be horrified with what they're doing with genetics at this point. Uh, my direct experience <coughs> with GMOs being an environmentalist and a biochemist <coughs> is absolutely horrifying 
There have been so many mistakes. So much stuff has been released. Um, he would really be railing against it. So, try another one. <laughs> anyway, um, with respect to the solution of polio, that too was incremental. Obviously, some vaccinations, some serious vaccinations occurred prior to that. That was a saving vaccine. Um, this is not a one-man, one-solution situation. It takes large numbers of people to solve these kinds of problems. So I think that model that you used, at very least, is weak. Please see if you can find a better one. Uh, social systems, you're ignoring the basic human social system of the village. Now the problem with the village is, like all biological systems, survival depends upon a group, not an individual. The individual's survival is of little importance. The survival of the group, including populations of species, is the critical thing. So the human village is really a fairly good system because abuse gets short, shortened very quickly. The head man overdoes it. The people simply ignore him or they beat him, literally. So um, that, as a model, has not really been looked at very well. It does work. Does it work well? No. Look around you, maybe not. Um, your streetlight system is horrendous. You're ignoring one very, very serious problem. If you don't obey the traffic light, the consequences are instantaneous and can be lethal. That's why people obey the traffic light. Not because they're nice, not because they're altruistic, but because the, the horrendous consequences are instantaneous and easy to understand. In other words, the scumbags that have stolen from us and have, you know, have depleted our resources need an instantaneous response. That will give uh, the kind of message and lesson that they will obey the rules. Right now they're not obeying the rules. Um, as for war, Read Sun Tzu, Ping Fa, if you want. He is probably the best proponent, and his uh, relative, uh, Sun Pin, both of whom studied war very, very carefully. You think it's not a good idea? I don't particularly like it. Unfortunately, it is a human reality. Is there a purpose for it? Yes, there is. We may not like it, but there is a purpose for it. Until we understand the purpose for it, Ignoring it is simply a mistake. Um, you ignore another very important social factor. It's called the prisoner's dilemma. Ultimately, it says altruism wins. That's why we are altruistic at all. It's because altruism really wins. It is the system that ultimately will succeed over and against selfishness, self-interest, capitalism, or any other system that is self-serving. This is what will win, ultimately. Okay. Um, uh, can I, all right, just one other thing with respect to biological systems. If you set up a matrix of the various interreactions and interactions of, of animals, the one thing that is the worst is direct competition. Biology avoids direct competition like the plague. You really need to look at that because competition is never the answer. It is, it is the least successful system in biology. Since they're going to be throwing bricks at me, I guess I'll let it go. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to mention the uh, a force more powerful as far as peace efforts. Uh, that's a book that it might be uh, interesting to, to take a look at. I forget the author. As far as the presentation, uh, materials are good. Now I have to say the crux of it is, I guess, these uh, the three principles of social organization. I don't really understand that very well. In spite of what I just said, I'm going to try to apply it. Uh, to some smaller things. 
this has to do with substance we intake. There's alcohol, there's uh, tobacco, there are legal drugs which are either over-the-counter or prescription drugs. All of those systems work moderately well. I know there are abuses, I know that, but generally speaking, they work fairly well. The one that doesn't work is the one I didn't mention, that's illegal drugs. It appears to me that that is the one that is the cause of the problem. And, and the major part of that appears to be that those substances are illegal. I'm getting this idea from this system as well as a book I'm reading, uh, Last Call, which is the history of prohibition in the United States, which is almost forgotten, especially for young people, uh, but it is almost forgotten in our history. And the people that were involved in that whole system are mainly uh, forgotten. I mean, I could name Wayne Wheeler. I mean, I never heard of that guy before I read the book. But he was one of the most famous guys in the United States in the 1920s. So this system all totally disappeared. And, uh, and I think it proved when they made it, again, legal and regulated. End of story. Okay, well, I'd like to thank our speaker for uh, for giving it uh, his, the old uh, college try here tonight and uh, having the guts to come in front of this crowd. Uh, about, a, about a few days ago, I, I sent an email to, to the College Complex's listserv, and I told Charlie that we should probably have a couple of guys in white coats here in case our speaker needs to be shoveled off to Elgin. Because this, this stuff looks nutty. You know, this, this is nutty. When we look at the website stuff, but I kind of see now uh, where you know. I, I kind of see where I'm try, trying to see where you're, where you're going. I, I mean, I kind of see what you're doing. Uh, and uh, so you know, it's I, I guess you could say commendable. Uh, I want to talk about a couple things here about uh, you know the, your analogy of uh, of stoplights. Uh, in uh, in uh, the Netherlands, they they have they're trying these things called Wooner Woonerfs. You heard of these Woonerfs? Woonerfs. W O O N E R F. Uh, they're experimenting with removing stoplights because stoplights kind of take responsibility away from people. They just see the green light and they just go, and then we we end up having quite a few crashes. And uh, but when when you have a Woonerf, that's a road without signals, people have to slow down and negotiate and look around and, you know, really know what the other guy's doing and everybody's like really careful now and they're really watching out. And that's actually, and, you know, some smaller towns they've done this, it's actually working better than the stoplights uh, because it is, you know, people having some responsibility. Now, uh, one thing about stoplights, by the way, uh, well, I'll mention here, I, I blurred it out right of way versus duty of care. In the, in the United States, we have right of, you know, we're a right of way country. So generally, it's whoever has the green light, you know, gets to go, and if they mow somebody down, that's, you know, a pedestrian, a blind guy is crossing the street, and it changes, you know, while he's, you know, while he's in the middle, and you, you run over him, well, that's a special case, because he's got the red tip cane. Well, let's say it's, you know, a, a, you know, a, a confused, you know, inebriated person, or, you know, something like that. Something, yeah. You know, you can run somebody over, like I work at a personal injury law firm, so I see these on a daily basis. Uh, you know, you hit somebody, that's, you, know, you have a green light, and you're pretty much uh, given a free, free ticket. In, in Europe, it's a duty of care uh, state, and especially, again, like in the Netherlands, um, you know, you're operating a piece of heavy, deadly machinery, and you have a higher responsibility, a higher duty of care to watch when you're passing through, just because you have a green light, doesn't mean you can just go blowing through there and killing any, you know, child or whatever that happens to be in your way. You have to still look around and be careful and operate that machinery. Now, I wish the United States was a was a duty of care state. And uh, I, know I, I know I myself don't drive. I, I switched to a bicycle and, and transit uh, about 10 years ago or so. 
But uh, you know, I, I, on occasion, I've been in a car with people, and I've watched them driving along. And I see that the lights green, and they're not checking when they go through an intersection, and they just go through this right, right through. And I'm like, oh my god, I can't wait to get out of this car. I, mean, I don't even like to ride in a car. They're so dangerous. It's such a horrible system, you know, to, to have these things driving around like this. Yeah, it is. You know, it's just really awful. Like I said, I work I, I, every day. I see mangled photos of mangled bodies. I I go to the uh, Daily Center and I get the death certificates of people that were killed. And uh, you know, it's just really an awful, awful system. And uh, but so you you never trust that green light. When you see a green light, you should still always slow down and look both ways. Because often, especially in Chicago, where you have people that are fleeing from the police, you know, gangbangers that just got done, you know, with a shootout or robbing a bank or something, and they're going. So you really can't trust them. There's out of towners that turn the wrong way on one way streets. So I, you know, I never trust a stoplight. And by the way, all this great road system that everybody likes and the highway system that was getting all this praise, you know. Well, Ivan Illich uh, made a good comment. On, uh, that you know, there's there's losers in this system, and the losers tend to be the non-motorized people, the bicyclists and the pedestrians. When you when you put in a highway, well, yeah, it's great for the affluent people that have these, you know, their fast cars. They go zooming at 60 miles an hour, no lights, so they have very few accidents. But what about the poor pedestrian and bicyclist? You have to go now miles out of your way to get to an underpass where it's safe to you, you know, for you to go through. Uh, so that's you know something there. Um, back on uh, being, uh, you know, working for your own self-interest. Okay, one reason I started bicycling is because it was, you know, uh, it, 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 it's for clean air. I mean, in a way, it's for my self-interest. Clean air, exercise, you know, environmental uh, concerns, economic concerns. I mean, it's cheaper. But I can't figure out why more people don't do it. It's still only, like in the Chicago area, you know, I think 1% or less of us uh, that do it. And I, I got about five minutes more worth to say, but I'm not, not going to have time. I couldn't believe that Bob Marder is proposing a socialist country where they have unions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh my what God. happened? Oh, my God. You learn something new every day. Boy, oh, boy. Bro, yeah. can you? Not here. No. Where did no, he get that? I'm, I'm entertained every night. So Sit I don't or what? You have a fever? A virus? Something? <laughs> I got something from Beatley. You ready? Yeah. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Kurt, for coming out and speaking to us tonight. Uh, what I heard tonight, um, and this came up in the question uh, portion of our evening, um, is the distinction between science and engineering. What I heard predominantly was social engineering. Um, and I just wanted to make a couple of observations. Um, one is that most of the pre-existing systems of social engineering, and there are many, the best known, of course, being Marxism, Leninism, um, ignores cultural distinctions to its peril. If you don't believe the peril part, go to Central and South America, where it failed miserably um, because they didn't pay attention to social distinctions in places like Ecuador and Mexico and Bolivia and so forth. Also, this assumption that humans are logical, question mark? I don't know. Um, but uh, getting back to the cultural point, because the logic one I can't really get into much without getting into philosophy, and uh, I don't feel like it tonight. Um, getting back to the cultural one, road systems are one that you use predominantly uh, as your example here. And if you've ever been to multiple cities, you've probably experienced that, yes, the roads have the same function that get you where you're trying to go. Yes, they have a lot of the same accoutrements, but they're different. They reflect different cultures, different time periods, different priorities. Uh, I grew up in New England. It's much harder to get from point A to point B in my home state than it is in Chicago. Okay? Um, and our state's not very big. I mean, you could fit six or seven Vermonts inside the state of Illinois. Uh, so there are some differences that are due both to geography in that case, but also some cultural differences as well. And I think that's uh, an area that a lot of social engineers uh, ignore to their peril. Um, but that, that is, as I said, predominantly what I heard tonight. There's a robust body of literature on this topic, which we did not hear about tonight, which makes me a little concerned uh, more than anything. Um, when I'm looking at a new theory, whether it's bold or modest, I want to see what the theory's in response to. 
Um, and what I heard tonight is I heard, first of all, got you interested in the topic, which is flight. Um, and I'm willing to go with that. I rolled with that because I have things that pop through my head that lead me in interesting directions, and I go with them. That's how intellectual inquiry works. But eventually you have to find, like, well, what are the people saying on this topic? Who are, like, the big names? What's going on here? And then how is this in response to that existing research? Um, and, and I was not hearing that, so it was very hard for me to contextualize this and place it into some sort of um, category, I guess you could say. But those are just the two things that I would say that don't necessarily negate your theory, but are definitely things you'll have to come to terms with, one being the cultural factor, um, because culture does very much influence the way that we structure things, uh, whether we're calling them system structures or whatever. Uh, and then also the fact of, of people being logical. Um, I think that's something that's just not borne out both in the um, historical record and also the scientific record. So thank you.
our society was developing and what could be a liberating tendency for uh, new, new arrangements of, of society. Uh, I hope that some people will take advantage of this meeting Monday night uh, to understand what the different uh, social tendencies and political tendencies are that are manifested in the Syrian conflicts uh, in order uh, to, uh, to come to a better resolution of them. Uh, not that, as, as you say, it's not uh, easy to, uh, to do so. You, you might, uh, if, if you understand the principles uh, of society, you can better resolve the contradictions. Okay. One hand, I was very gratified to hear uh, the comment about against uh, uh, all these rallies and prayer meetings and all this pious moralizing is not the way to get peace. I've thought that for some years. That's about all I ever hear around here is a lot of moralizing. Uh, it's supposed it, everybody's supposed to change his morality and somehow everybody be nice to everybody else and somehow things are going to work. Well, it doesn't look like it. The thing I didn't really like too much was equating the scientific method applied to unmotivated behavior because flight is a simple physical process. There's no motivation, no choice being made by the air or the airplane. With motivated behavior, motivated human behavior. Now to go into this in any depth, I think would require a, a speech in itself. All I'm gonna do is recommend a few books to read on this general topic. But anyway, all right, I read a book, I came across a book about four years ago that answered some questions that have been rattling around in my head for several years, ever since the college economics course, I got exposed to the idea that we need war to keep everybody working, and inflation, we have a choice between inflation and uh, uh, unemployment. And I never could understand that. And the closest analogy I could think of was, you know, a car radiator, car has to have a radiator to uh, dissipate excess heat. <coughs> but anyway, this book presented a theory of cooperation, not just, not just answering these questions, which gave me a, a, a handle on it, on these questions. But uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, pointing to, to in some ways that other people can get a handle on these things, which I didn't really hear too much from the speaker tonight. I mean, just exactly what would he do scientifically, scientifically abolish war. I don't think it's going to be with any, there are some <coughs> very general analogies of flight, <coughs> but flight is unmotivated behavior. It's not people making choices. <coughs> Motivated behavior requires a different method and a different branch of science. 
this book is called How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation by Harry Brown, which showed not only how <coughs> uh, cooperation evolves, but a currency along with it. I didn't hear anything tonight about currency as being a, 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 a means of cooperation. But that's how we can cooperate with people in Baltimore or Los Angeles or Timbuktu or whatever. It's a currency of some sort. There really isn't any other way to do it. Halfway mm, from Wall Street. Uh, well, that's the, you know, you, you, you know, if you understand the, you know, I mean, you, you, you're the second fool at a time. I mean, you don't have a mi the microphone. But uh, anyway, Wall Street is very much a product of the government. Karl Marx says, a quote from Karl Marx somewhere, that the government is the executive committee of the ruling class. It's something that, yeah, well, okay, I, I can't give an exact quote. I'd like to have an exact quote if there is one. <coughs> but all these corporations, they're all getting federal move in one way or another. Federal advantages or subsidies or whatever. And then you call that a free market. Well, anyway. Yeah, the other thing you want to read is the first few eight numbers of the Federalist Papers, which has a very, Federalist number six, has a very, very potent analysis of the ulterior motivations for war. The Federalist number eight has some very, uh, very, well, you can see it today. I mean, I, I read, tried reading this in the up. But anyway, that's what a war mentality does to you. Time's up. Who is in charge? He is the one who has yeah. the clock, right? Why don't you shut up? <coughs> <laughs> that's that's not a war. war. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 11.2. Right. <laughs> now, I'm going to be very brief. Be a very concise. I don't think a lot of you guys really got what this speaker is trying to say tonight because of the analogies that the speaker was trying to use to convey his thought of cooperation and consent. The red light illustration was meant to be a simple illustration of consenting people realizing a certain amount of rules that they cooperate because it's in their all their mutual best interest. That's the reason he brought the stoplight analogy up. I think that if you could take a look at some of the evolving technology with computers, it might even prove to be a better analogy for you. Because, you know, it the whole purpose that the internet was brought out for was for cooperation and communication. Nobody can communicate without using a thing, something called hypertext transfer protocol. If you don't use it, there are other ways to do it, but you're not going to be in the mainstream. <coughs> there are certain standards that the Consumer Electronic Association and the IEEE use over and over again to bring people cooper that cooperate. Whether you be a dictator or you be a capitalist, you still have to use a certain standard for television broadcasting. You may be a dictatorship or you may be a capitalist, but you still have to use a common currency. You, even if you're a crook, you still have to have a certain means of value. And I think with your stoplight analogy, that's exactly the point you were trying to make. Am I correct in that assumption? The second part is I think we only saw maybe a little bit of your work tonight. Just a very tits bit because of the length of time that you had on the subject. And I, as a Toastmaster, I could have seen your, what you had covered in an hour, covered in about five or six minutes given the right analogy and the right types of things. 
I would have loved to have heard a little bit more concisely. I mean, it's going to take work, I understand that, because you're developing a lot of theories down to something. But And I know you've got some solutions in there, because if I take a look at your website and everything else, it's all there. And a lifetime's worth of work trying to be boiled down to an hour's presentation is a lot of work. But if, you take, if you're looking for a good book that almost parallels exactly what you're looking for, Look at a gentleman by the name of Hernando de Soto, who oh, wrote a book geez. called The Mystery of Capital. Another one that you might want to consider, too, is uh, just basically Thomas Friedman's The World is Flat. And finally, uh, one that's a little bit more obscure is called um, The Pentagon's New Map by uh, Thomas P. M. Barnett. All of their gist of their presentations are available online and in short video formats. So you can get the gist of the books if you don't want to read them. And even now, because I'm into video and everything else, standards, technology, cooperation, uh, competition under cooperation, following the rules, it's been done. And I will not say anymore. Thank you very much. All right, let's thank our speaker once again. Really, don't forget your clip here. Uh, very nice, and put together PowerPoint and everything. You have some I'll be yes. very quick, because we're uh, going through. Yeah, I know the uh, the amount of cooperation in the capitalist community is is, is certainly an example. Of, it's, it's cut through bitter competition. What are you talking about? You have to have There is money. no, it is the total absence of cooperation. <laughs> Demolish your competitor. <laughs> Take his product and, and drive it out of the market. There's no cooperation. Are you, where are you from on this? All right, I'll be clear. Philip Smog, sleep. Never mind. <laughs> Go ahead, I, what do you got to say? Competition brings out the worst in people, <laughs> yeah, but produces the best this in the products. Cooperation in the economic community. Yeah, we're, that's why we're uh, the bread lines are out there. Um, we saw the banks cooperate with one another, and the people in their homes that you know they kicked out. You know, a real lot of cooperation. That's there, be, that's know. not capitalism. Yeah, it's mercantilism. Yeah, you know, out Charlie. All right, you take Be science. Me. What do you got? You've got a process of inquiry. Okay. You engage in experiment. You take test and measurement, and you arrive at technology. Uh, what does this have to do with our relationships as human beings? Technology is manipulating uh, the, the, the physical world. Uh, if anything, the end result of that te technology, I'm sorry, is nothing but regulation. Um, so you take the, let's use your thing of transportation. We take the technology, the science has given us the technology of transportation, getting from point A to B. Now I and Bob prefer the technology of cement and the construction of sidewalks. And some people like the technology of the private corporate jet. However, there has to be decisions made. Science avails us not one, I'm sorry, Doug, the, it's, it's impartial. It's, it's arbitrary and capricious. It's valueless. It does not make a decision whether or not Bob and I get our mode of transportation or the CEOs get theirs. That's a decision that made, and that's, that's going to be weighed upon factors, and people are going to make a decision on that. What's going to happen in the end? Um, and I don't know how you can how you can arrive at it. It's a process that enables us to, if anything, expand our options. But what options we choose is totally apart from the process of science. Um, scientific method regarding war and peace, if anything, has enabled us to engage in warfare on a scale like we've never just beyond our, our wildest imaginations. 
to say that it's going to be used as a process for peace, I have to stop a moment and say, no. It's been anything it's generated warfare on a scale like like we more than we really need. I mean, we can kill very well these days. Um, let's see, but, um, okay, we've gone over that. Uh, Let's see, if you wanted to sing this, this topic also has been covered, I believe, in a movie we may show sometime. I have a copy, it's called Metropolis. Ah. And society is in chaos, and men of science arrive, as a matter of fact, they arrive via <laughs> airplanes and restructure society. So you can take a look at that, maybe we'll show it sometime and get you back here. Now the last thing i got to wonder about here, is that you list here, sir, <laughs> unsuccessful social systems, and I'm rather surprised to find that the union organized labor movement in the union that I've been engaged in for well over a quarter of a century is an unsuccessful social system comparable to children's sports leagues. Well, sir, if we are so unsuccessful, how many of you are going to work tomorrow? <laughs> How many of your children are going to work tomorrow? How many of you are likely to be killed on, at work next week? I, and I could go on and on and on. Far from being unsuccessful, we're probably the third most successful social system you're going to find. Um, Really, we are not in children's sports league, and one reason, that's why the organized labor movement, if you want, I think there's a valid argument, I've read this, is the oldest social system in the United States, and its longevity must attest to its necessity and its success. Thank you, have a nice holiday. Speaker gets the last word. Kurt, you've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds. You guys are great. I, I, I was going to raise my hand. I don't have to be recognized to ask a question. Uh, <laughs> my How many hours do I have? Oh, Holy. Uh, you don't. Probably about three to five minutes. Okay. Here's the bet. You know, I'm out here. I'm for real. And if you know anybody who wants to talk about this, you want to let anybody know that I'm playing and I'm serious. I'd be happy to come talk to any group. There, um, there we go, I get up. My wife knows this. I'm running the net. I go and I open the computer and I check to see if there's enough time left to solve this problem. We're on death's door. We have to solve this problem. We'll annihilate ourselves over here. George Cayley described the three elements would be required of flight. They were propulsion lift, and control. The very first flights that ever accomplished propulsion, lift, and control simultaneously and attained the state of flight was December 17, 1903, Kitty Hawk. No right was killed in an airplane. In 1905, 1906, they were displaying the 1905 Right flyer 1905 to the U.S. Army, a colonel was in a, in a, in a plane with Laurel Wright, and that plane crashed, and the observer died. First, first accident in an airplane. Yeah. Or Wilbur Wright died in 1910 or 1911 in New York, and I believe a typhoid fever. Or Will Orville Wright was out of the airplane business in 1915. He never did it again. They were overtaken by a man named Glenn Curtis, who was also a bicycle pilot, mechanic, and he's the one who perfected the wing that was actually the one more successful than the Wrights. Two bicycle mechanics got that. There's a reason for that. I know my minutia. You want to talk about it? I got hours to talk about it. So that's just to establish that. I can't talk about all that. There's more important things to talk about it. When I deal with a, an idea of a sustainable society, I look at a society that is capable of staying and not breaking down in war as long as the climate and the environment of this planet is capable of sustaining the human social life, human race. That's my definition of sustainable.
That's what I play for. I do not play for an hour. I do not play for a nation. I do not play for 10 years. I don't play for a generation. I play for the whole bottle of wax. That's how I answer my question. If anything is a successful system, it has the capacity to enable this human race to sustain over the same period of time that the climate will sustain us. That's the standard I set. So, I'm trying to think of what else I'd like to say here. Um, all the evidence does go against me. You can dredge up evidence to dis dis dispute everything I've said tonight. And I am. I know about this uh, this proving the hypothesis thing. You know what that does? That enables us to, repute, to be unable to prove that cigarettes kill children and allows us to continue marketing cigarettes to human beings. The process, I am not a scholar of war. I could give a shit about war. I could care, I care as much about war as, I care, as George Cayley cared about, worried about flight crashes. He wanted to learn how to fly, and I want to, he studied birds because they could fly, and I want to live in peace, and I study systems that, can, that suggest they have the capacity. I don't care about war. I could give a shit about war. I'm not interested. I don't care what anybody says about it. There's nothing to be learned in war, regardless of what anybody says, as far as I'm concerned. So, um, just want to let you know my position on that, because I'm not going to, I'm not going to go study it. It's just, it's a waste of time. A lot of people study war. Nobody's made any success. Why should I repeat what anybody else has done? It's, it's just what I'm up to. The vaccine. Here, somebody disputed the, the, the value of studying SOC as a vaccine. You know, SOC solved the problem of polio. He had the option of getting a patent and he had an option of getting rich. And he said, I'll give the solution to polio to mankind for the benefit of mankind. Now, we have all kinds of vaccines that are being created today. They're not being created for the benefit of mankind. They're being created for the benefit of corporations. They're not in the same league. And to say that the history of vaccines today is any degradation of, of studying SOC as a model of solving a problem is incorrect. You know, to say that Mendel, that, 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 that what has been done with the, the gene, it validates Mendel as a, as, a, as a successful finder is, is not much of an argument. I don't want to argue these points much, but I just want to point out, I'm not playing to be a philosopher. I'm not here playing to solve a problem. And I'm following the method that has worked in the past. And I know that it gets difficult. And I understand it's a very difficult swing. And yes, I'd love to be able to reduce this to five minutes. But I think, in fact, if you want to learn what I want to learn, you'd have to spend as much time learning as you'd have to learn to say, learn, to learn chemistry, or learn any other science. I've got 20 years of this. I can talk forever about it. So thank you very much. All right, love you. Come back if you want.